that which uh, was read for the call to worship by Julie earlier. This scripture is perhaps one of your favorite, one of my favorite. Dear Lord, you know how many songs have been written with these kinds of passages? And it's like a total awakening comes when I read these passages. This is, Dory and I picked this up at Toronto Airport Christian Fellowship uh, Revival Center in Canada. Beautiful picture of the open Bible, the open word of God, and the sword of the spirit here. The word of God becomes a sword in our lives. And God wants that to be true for all of us, to believe his word, that his word, the word becomes flesh in us. But stand with me right now. Uh, there's Bibles in the pew there, if you don't have yours with you. Word of God is powerful, it is sharp. It becomes a rhema word in our lives. But let's, let's read it. Just back up to verse 6 of Isaiah 52. We're into the ser- what are called the servant songs of Jesus that reveal Jesus 700 years before he comes. But Isaiah 52, 6, beautiful context here. Therefore, my people will know my name. Therefore, in that day, they will know that it is I who foretold it. Yes, it is I. Verse 7, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, your watchmen. These are prayer warriors on the, um, on the fortresses as watchmen to watch out for a coming enemy. Listen, you watchmen, lift up your voices. Together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. Burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem. War has come, had come upon you for so long, but the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. And then move forward to verse 13. Here's the revelation of the suffering servant, the king of kings. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised up and lifted up, highly exalted, just as there are many who were appalled at him. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle the work of a priest, the sprinkle many nations, And kings will shut their mouths in awe of him. For what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. But who will believe our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Lord, we humble our hearts before you without revelation. None of us can see this arm of the Lord in our day and in our generation. Without revelation coming to us, Lord, we all miss it. We all go about very, very busy with our lives, Lord, we understand. But Lord, we thank you that you pierce through the darkness. You arrest our attention. And you speak deeply to our souls that we're not alone. I am with you. I am terribly fond of you. I love you with an everlasting love. Draw close to the one who loves you. Know my name. In the precious name of Jesus, everyone said amen. Amen. God bless you. These are precious passages. Every Sunday, I get this sense of being overwhelmed. Whenever I open scriptures, there are those times of grace when you just breathe it in and ask for grace. We live in a dry and a weary land where there is no water, and the scriptures are pregnant Pregnant with living water for us. Well, one of my favorite teachers at North Central Bible College, I could mention his name. He's been in these parts. His name was Ernest Freeman. And he was a favorite teacher of mine, North Central Bible College, North Central University back then. And he actually made it up in these parts. He came to Old Church of the Redeemer. How many of you remember when Ernest Freeman, his wife Lois, and two children came to Church of the Redeemer. He was going to be a missionary in Yugoslavia. 
He's a wonderful teacher, a little bit difficult of a teacher at times, but someone told me in my first year at North Central Bible College that Ernest Freeman was one of their least favorite teachers and said, whatever you do, do not take a class with Ernest Freeman. He's so hard, he's so difficult, and he's so insensitive to the needs of students. So in my haste of signing up, I wanted to take this class called Christian Literature that studied the writings of C.S. Lewis, the Chronicles of Narnia, that studied the writings of J.R. Tolkien, that studied the writings of uh, Charles Williams, a noted uh, friend of uh, C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien. And I signed up for the class, and I didn't care who was teaching it. I didn't even notice who was teaching it. So there was Ernest Freeman as the teacher for that. And I'm thinking, oh, no, I didn't take this godly advice from this person. But Ernest Freeman became my favorite teacher at North Central Bible College. He came to uh, Church of the Redeemer. He pastored a bridge church out here in Beverly, New Christie, and Mark Rautala. We all begin to develop distorted and erroneous images of people through what we hear from other people because someone has had a bad experience, someone misinterpreted someone or was hurt by someone, and not to minimize anyone's sorrow or or what they've gone through. But the same is true, brothers and sisters, with regard to our revelation of the Lord. We all have distorted and erroneous images of God that are incorrect. They're just not correct. And how many of you know Satan is out to try to tell you God is really not who you think he is? He is a big, big bully. You think uh, you know some personal bullies in your life. Well, God is this big bully. And and Satan tries to get us to think that God is this evil monger. But most of our distorted and erroneous images of God that are incorrect are due to, uh, this is what psychologists and others say, Christian and psychologists, due to, number one, terrible experiences in our lives that become strongholds of despair. We develop terrible images of God. Where is God in the midst of the pain of my life? Where is God? Why did he let this happen? If you saw the movie, The Shack, Mackenzie, why, God, did you allow my daughter to go through this? But we have terrible experiences. We develop distorted images of God through that. Also, misunderstandings of Scripture, in particular, God's wrath or God's apparent absence in difficult times. His word is confusing to us. We pick up his word, and sometimes we sense condemnation. Uh, Sometimes a passage is confusing to us. How many of you have ever looked at an Old Testament passage or the book of Revelation, New Testament, is filled with God's pouring out? How many of you have ever been confused by those passages once in a while? Misunderstanding of Scripture. Number three, authority figures who send us wrong messages. Clergy can be parents. It can be teachers in school. They send us wrong, you know, send us wrong messages about who God is. We, how many of you have ever struggled in your relationship with Abba Father because your relationship with your earthly father hasn't been very ideal? It's classic. It happens to so many people, it's hard to keep track of it. It's definitely a, a true reality that we all have. Uh, Albert Einstein resisted uh, an understanding of a personal God because he had a personal grudge towards the clergy of his day. It's in his writings. It's in his uh, memoirs. Interesting. We'll bring some more on that next week. But also satanic lies, the fourth perhaps in all of these kind of overlap, but satanic lies from the pit of hell. Satan is so jealous of what you and I have and what we can have as we go deeper in the Lord. But Jesus comes to clear all of this up. Jesus comes. Look at the Isaiah 52 passage, uh, verse 6. Therefore, my people will know my name. 
to know the name of the Lord is so crucial in our lives so that when the snowstorm comes in and uh, smashes your picnic, that you don't take it personally, but you learn how to interpret God accurately. When Tom Brady falls at the airport, when we touch down in Shannon Airport there in Ireland, he falls down in the first half hour. How do you interpret that? Do we get angry at God or do we say, the Lord is with us? The Lord delights in the way of the ones whose steps he makes firm. Even if he stumbles, you shall not fall, for the Lord upholds him with his righteous right hand. God keeps on holding on, and he says, I will never leave you or, nor forsake you, no matter what. But Jesus has a passion. Look at John chapter 17. The passion of Jesus in Mike Bickle's wonderful book, A Passion for Jesus, says the number one passion of Jesus is to reveal the Father to us, to show us who he is. And look at uh, John 17, 6. I have revealed your name. The NIV says, I have revealed you, which is exactly what's going on there. But the Greek text underlying this says, I have revealed your name to those whom you gave me out of this world. Therefore, Jesus has a passion to reveal the name of God to us so that we can derive the benefits, have the relationship, not believe the lies, not believe uh, what what other people are saying, sometimes well-intentioned. But it's important that we know this name. One of my favorite names is Elohim. And of course, it's right there in Genesis chapter 1, the first phrase is, Velrishith bara Elohim, in the beginning, God. It's the word Elohim. And it's a very important Hebrew word because it happens to be in the plural. Elohim, the little him ending, it means in the plural. But how many of you know the Hebrew Bible is not teaching us that God is into polytheism? The Elohim denotes the dimensions of who God is. That is, God, the multiplicity of who God is, is beyond our ability to fully chronicle and comprehend. That is, God is way outside of the box that we put in him. How can you or I conceive of a God who always was, always will be, and will go into eternity? How can our little brains, our little computer of brains, grasp someone of this nature? Elohim, the multiplicity of his majesties and his mercies. Theologians use word like omnipresence. That is, God is everywhere all the time. How can he do that? Can you do that? Can I do that? Omnipotence, all-powerful. Omniscient, the little word science in there. God is the scientist, that is, he has all knowledge. All knowledge comes from him. You have a smartphone, God is way smarter than your smartphone. You have an up-to-date computer, awesome. God is way smarter than your up-to-date computer. And the, the word of the Lord says, your Elohim reigns. Your God, it's the word Elohim, your God reigns. He's ruling, he's in control. Years ago, we sang the song, our God reigns, our God reigns. You know, how many of you sang that song? I love the anointing that comes. First of all, you say to Zion, your God reigns. And the promises of God are faithful and true to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That should be good news to us. Because God is faithful to all of his promises that he makes to his people throughout all time and all of us. And as we come to him, so important to proclaim that and recognize that. He is the Lord, the creator of the universe. I have, what did I bring? Did I bring my little National Geographic? I just finished a National Geographic magazine uh, called Interstellar. It's all up-to-date information uh, on what's going on in the universe and the power and the majesty, the power of our sun, the power of the stars and the skies. You begin to study 
science. It doesn't intimidate me what people say. I know firmly in my heart is the understanding that God is the creator. The Bible declares he is Bore Elohim. He is the creator, creator of the universe. You begin to study the, the scientific realms and you say, oh my God, I believe God is the creator of all this. He is the one who brought all of this into existence. That should bring us to the throne of worship. Say, oh my God. Worthy is the Lord to receive praise, honor, and glory. For thou hast created all things, and for thyself they are created. Oh, dear Lord, which should bring us to the place of worshiping the Lord. And then as we get a hold of the truth, Elohim, your God is reigning, he is ruling. Jesus comes and he says, the kingdom of God is at hand. God is about to do something unprecedented. Repent and believe the good news. Get your life in order with what he's doing. Believe God is doing something right now. And we need to have that fine-tuning of the spirit. But that we might know his name. Elohim is a very important understanding of who God is. Whenever you see, in the Hebrew Bible in particular, the Old Testament, whenever you see the word God behind it stands Elohim. And you can say that. Another name that's really important of who God is that my people know my name is that I am who I am. Powerful name. Uh, turn back to the book of Exodus. I believe that when we study the names of God, renewal, revival comes into our hearts. God reveals himself to us that he's greater than the circumstance. He's greater than the situation. He's greater than the sorrow. We don't fully understand it, but he's an awesome God. And when we come to him and worship at his footstool, when we come and bow down before him and have that revelation that Jesus puts in our hearts, we fall in love with him and we are strengthened and we are empowered. Moses came to the Lord and he was a stutterer. He had all kinds of issues in his life. He did not want to go back. Moses said to the Lord in Exodus 3, 11, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And Elohim says to him, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. And then he begins to show him. And then, and then uh, Moses said, Well, who are you? What shall I tell the Israelites? And the Lord says in verse 14, pick this up with me in uh, Exodus 3, 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name for." Ever. It's the self revelation of God, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. It's, it's the Hebrew uh, uh, verb for being, for being and doing. That God is saying, like, I will be who I will be through my actions. I am happening. I am coming into being for you. I am manifesting myself. I will be present. And the God who is about to free Israel from the bondage of Egypt is saying, I am going to be with you to manifest myself. Now, Jesus fascinatingly picks up on this language of I am. Remember the Lord said, this is the name that I will be remembered from Generation to generation. Imagine Jesus saying this, John 8, 58, before Abraham was born, I am. How could somebody say that? He would get in trouble. And they picked up stones. Before, I mean, if I stood before you and said, brothers and sisters, before Abraham was born, Scott Smith is I mean, what a ludicrous thing to say. <laughs> Call 911. He's been doing this for way too long. Just carry him off, put a white coat on him, and 
let him rest. <laughs> Jesus comes and he says, before Abraham was born, I am. And I believe the earth under his feet must have trembled in those moments. And they call him the seven great I am sayings of Jesus. Jesus comes and he says, I am. It's the same understanding of the verb here. I am the light of of the world. Whoever follows me shall not be in darkness. They shall have the light of life. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. He says, I am the door for the sheep. You can come in and find good pasture and go out, and I will be your good shepherd. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He comes and he says, I am am and the earth shakes the way the truth and the life i am the true vine whoever abides in me shall bear fruit what amazing statements that jesus has made he says them to you and i to root us in who he is his promises he is unstoppable he is unshakable and he invites us into fellowship with himself if you abide in me and I abide in you, you shall bear much fruit to my Father's glory. It's a wonderful revelation. You shall know the name of the Lord. And as we go back to Isaiah 52, we see this beautiful picture of redemption. God's redemption coming in. He brings forgiveness. He brings compassion. In the original context when Isaiah 52 was written, you're talking about the restoration of the Jewish people coming back to Israel. And they were going to come back. The temple was going to be rebuilt. The temple was going to be restored. But God's people also came back. In 1948, Israel had been dispersed amongst the nations for almost 2,000 years. But God kept his promise. In 1948, Israel was back on the map again. And I love the phrase, when the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. There is a large group of Messianic Jews in Israel right now proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah. There are conservative Jews that are yearning and hungering for the Messiah, those who do not yet believe in Jesus, who are going to believe in Jesus. There is what is called by scholars the warming of the Jewish heart towards Jesus going on in our day. This uh, verse of scripture here, how beautiful on the mountain are the feet of those who bring good news. Uh, turn with me to Romans chapter 10. Paul quotes this as referring to Jesus. Romans chapter 10, verse 15. And how can they preach unless they are sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Speaking of preachers, speaking of Jesus himself, ultimately. But it's a beautiful picture, this how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. The mountains that surround Jerusalem is a beautiful, 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 wonderful picture. But it's the picture of a herald coming back from a battle scene. The herald is coming back, and he's got a scroll in his hand, and he's come to say, the battle belongs to the Lord. The Lord is in control. Your God reigns. Do not be afraid. Do not be frightened, because God has won the battle. The victory is assured. And he runs with the herald and the good news. He says, your God is in control. Peace shall reign on the earth. Glad tidings. God will save. God will deliver. It's the power of the gospel, the power of the gospel. And we see it in the first coming of the Lord, and we see it in the second coming of the Lord. When the Lord returns to Zion, how many of you are looking forward to Jesus coming? The Bible clearly says he will return first to Jerusalem, and then all of the earth shall see him, shall see the salvation of our God. The, the scripture says, amazingly, and see the beautiful flow of this, verse 10, the Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations. Ultimately, 
all of the ends of the earth will see the salvation. It's interesting, a little Hebrew word study. The word salvation means exactly this, Yeshua. All the world will see, and the Hebrew text says, the Yeshua of the Lord. All the world shall see the Yeshua. Yeshua literally means Yahweh, Yahweh, is salvation. All the world will eventually see him. Right now, there is a kind of a, a, a revelation that comes to some, but not all. But this word for the arm of the Lord, how many of you have ever seen? Remember uh, Popeye, the sailor man? And what does he do? He opens up a can of what? Spinach. Years later, I found out I love spinach salads. And I always think of Popeye the Sailor Man because he gets strong when he eats his spinach. But then he shows his arm. He shows his arm. After he eats the spinach, Popeye's arm gets humongous. And Brutus is done for. This skinny, scrawny sailor by the name of Popeye rises up and becomes this mighty Brutus crusher, crushing the brute. I, I just love that story growing up as a kid. How many of you have never heard of Popeye the Sailor Man? We've got to enrich your life. But uh, this image of the arm of the Lord is so powerful. Look at Deuteronomy. This is, uh, excuse me, Deuteronomy 33.7. This was Marilyn Sundley. Just loved this passage. She loved this song, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Look at what it says in verse 27 of Deuteronomy 33. Remember, all the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus. Look at this, this metaphor, this picture of God's strong arm. The eternal God is your refuge. Receive this, brother. Receive this, sister. The eternal God. God, Elohim, is your refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms of the Lord. God is mighty. He's flexing his muscle in the gospel. Underneath are the everlasting arms. Look at what Job, the Lord speaks to Job and says, do you have an arm like God's? Job 40, 29. Uh, look at... Uh, Psalm 77, the Psalms are filled with this revelation. And God wants you and I to have this revelation of the Lord will lay bare his holy arm in your life in the sight of all the nations. Psalm 77, verse 15 says, with your mighty arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. Look at Psalm 79, 11. We don't have time to go through all of the verses of Scripture here. May the groans of the prisoners come before you. By the strength of your arm, preserve those condemned to die. It's a reference to the gospel that God will come and he will set free those who are bound in prisons. Release them from condemnation even now as we hear the word of God. God is coming to smash the dungeons of darkness in your life and set you free with the knowledge of his love, his compassion. Don't believe the lies of the enemy about who God is. Psalm 89, verse 10. You crushed Rahab like one of the slain. With your strong arm, you scattered your enemies. Psalm 89, verse 13. Your arm is endued with Power. Your hand is strong. Your right hand is exalted. Psalm 89, verse 21. My hand will sustain him. Surely my arm will strengthen him. Psalm 98, verse 1. These are beautiful verses that utilize uh, that beautiful image of the Lord, Psalm 98, verse 1. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand, his holy arm, have worked salvation for him. Uh, Mary gets in the act here with this metaphor that's so strong. Uh, Luke 121, the Magnificat of Mary uh, in Luke 121.
Okay, where to go? Luke 1, 21. Ah, I lost it for a second here. Okay, we'll have to recoup on that. It's definitely in that vicinity, though. <laughs> Yeah, Mary's song is in 146 there. We'll get that. Trust me, Mary is into using that metaphor as well. My apologies on that. Oh, is it 51? Thank you, thank you. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. And look at John 12, 38. Here is the quotation of Isaiah 53, verse 1. Even after, verse 37, even after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, Isaiah 53, 1. Lord, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. There is general revelation in all of creation. God comes and reveals himself in all of the world as creator God. But there is also specific revelation that comes into our lives that Jesus is the Lord. He is the Mashiach. He is the Savior. And then in the, the flow of the uh, Isaiah passage here, it, it's so beautiful to see this. How beautiful on the mountain are the feet of those who bring good news, proclaiming peace, who say to Zion, your God reigns. The Lord will unbear his holy arm in the sight of all the nations. And then comes uh, the prelude to Isaiah 53. Behold, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Here comes that revelation of Jesus. And it is a revelation. Remember, Jesus asked the disciples, who do they say that I am? And some say John the Baptist. Some say Jeremiah. Some say the, one of the prophets. And Peter comes along and he says, I say that you are the son of God. I say that you are the Messiah of Israel. And Jesus says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. That is, it doesn't come through human intelligence. Do you realize how graced you are to be here today? We are blessed beyond measure. God has revealed Jesus to you. Instead of Jesus being a stumbling block, Jesus is a stepping stone for you in your life that you will forever know who God is. We are blessed beyond measure beyond what words can express to see Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, as the suffering servant who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed, Isaiah 53, 1. He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected of men. He was a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering, one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. But surely he was taking up my infirmities, our infirmities, the, the sick the sin and sicknesses of the whole world. Surely he took up our infirmities and he carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. Dear Jesus, we are blessed beyond measure beyond what words can express to see Jesus, to receive this revelation. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When the Lord returns to Zion, he shall come as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. The ultimate arm of the Lord is Jesus who crushes the head of the serpent. Oh, the blood of the Passover Lamb the blood of the Passover lamb. We love to sing that beautiful song. 
Thank you. Oh, the blood of the Passover lamb is applied to the door of my life. No power of darkness could ever withstand the force of Jesus' blood sacrifice. Though Satan will bring any accusation against you, against me, against our church, we let him know right where we stand. For now, there is no condemnation. We are under the blood. We are under the blood of the Lamb. Under the blood of the Lamb that covers the guilt of our past. By the mercy of God, holy and righteous we stand. I am under the blood of the Lamb. I am safe. I am secure. And I am sometimes dangerous to Satan. I am safe and secure from the enemy's plan. For no weapon formed against us shall stand. That's the revelation of God's love for you. Don't believe the enemy's lies. Don't believe the enemy's lies. As Lou said about his wife, Gwen, the pain and the suffering in her life legitimized the anointing in her life. That is, true authority comes from experiencing suffering and sorrow and trusting God through it. True authority, and this is the story of Jesus, true authority comes from knowing a measure of suffering and sorrow and trusting God through it. You will crush the head of the serpent. You, we, this generation will crush the head of the serpent. The presence of any pain in our lives should not be minimized. But the presence of pain is not the absence of God's love. God still loves you. Brother, sister, God still loves you. He is so fond of you. He loves you so much. I cannot begin to absorb or comprehend it to tell you. So I have to pray and say, Lord, please reveal it to us. Please reveal it to us. Oh, God, please reveal it to us. How beautiful on the mountain are the feet of Jesus. He comes with good news for you. He comes with good news for me, saying, your God is reigning. He's about to do something powerful. The kingdom is coming. The kingdom is breaking through. Your God reigns in your life. Hold on and believe the promises. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Underneath are the everlasting arms, the might, the strength, the omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent God. And he loves you. He loves you. True authority in your life will come from knowing some suffering and sorrow, but rising above it, trusting in God because God is worthy of trust. Thank you, Abba, Father. Lord, thank you for these precious men and women, Lord. Thank you, Abba, Father. We bless the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Abba. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Abba, Father. Just uh, put your hand on your heart right now and your mind, your mind. Lord, we, we just pray for each other right now, Lord. Sometimes I misunderstand things. Sometimes I stumble and I fall and I don't always know how to get back up again. But Lord, you always help me. You help us, Lord. Sometimes we stumble and fall. Sometimes we're on the brink of a dream coming true, but we stumble and we fall. But Lord, you say the Lord delights in the way of the one whose steps he makes firm. Even if he stumbles or falls, the Lord upholds him with his mighty right hand. The Lord will never leave us nor forsake us. The Lord will always be there. He is committed to being there. Lord, heal our minds of distorted images of God. The enemy comes and tells us lies from the pit about who God is. But Jesus comes and tells us how awesome God is. The love of God. Oh, God so loved the world. These are the very words of Jesus. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. Lord, we break through the lies that are in our minds. We break through the lies of our hearts, Lord, that we have taken into our souls. Any behavior that has caused strongholds to exist. Heal our hearts, Lord Jesus. Thank you for Esther. Thank you, Lord, for Esther. She came to the kingdom of Persia for such a time as this. She realized her redemptive purpose. These men and women, Lord, let us all reveal 
receive the revelation of the redemptive purpose, why we're here, to crush the serpent's head. In the precious name of Jesus, we bless you and thank you. Thank you, Abba Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Abba, faithful God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So, Lord, you're we're doing a healing work in our hearts, Lord. We acknowledge that. We're, you're doing a healing work in our lives. And we just bless the one on our right, the one on our left now. Thank you, Lord. This is a unique season in Christian Renewal Church's life. But we thank you. This extremity is your opportunity. Show us the way through it, Lord. Raise up a treasurer for us. Raise up an elder for us, Lord Jesus, because you know we need them. We believe you and we trust you, Lord, that you're going to help us walk through this in the name of Jesus. No matter what storms come against us, Lord, we thank you, O oh God, that you are with us and you will reveal yourself to each and every one in the awesome name of Jesus. Thank you, Abba Father. Thank you, Lord. God bless you. I just bless you. Bless you, brothers and sisters. I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. I bless you with revelation of the goodness of God. May the spirit of wisdom and revelation be upon you to know the Lord, to know him, to walk with him, to enjoy him, to know the fullness of his grace and his kindness, his spirit in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Abba Father. Thank you, Abba Father. True authority. There is someone who is receiving a major upgrade in authority. A major upgrade in in authority in your life. Spiritual authority is coming to you. Spiritual authority to trample on snakes and scorpions, to overcome all the power of the enemy. Spiritual authority is coming to the church on the North Shore in an unprecedented way. And we will give you the glory and we will give you the praise in the name of Jesus. There are some individuals here today who are going to have increased spiritual authority because of what you've walked through. May your knowledge of the Lord, blessed be the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we receive it by faith in Jesus' name. Authority to heal, to know the word that sustains the weary. He will waken you morning by morning to listen like one being taught. The sovereign Lord, Yahweh Adonai, will awaken you morning by morning to listen like one who is being taught. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Abba Father. Thank you, Lord. Bless your holy name. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we just uh, thank you and receive all that you're wanting to give throughout this day, throughout this season, Abba Father. In Jesus, your precious name, we pray. Thank you, Lord. Dory's going to join me here. And just, uh, if you would like to be prayed for, we would love to pray for you. Dory, if you could just join me here. This is Dory's, my uh, 36, is it? 36 wedding anniversary. So how many of you just want to pray a little prayer over Dory and myself? This woman deserves a hand for staying married to me for 36 years. Just give her a hand. <laughs> So, Lord, we, we thank you that you have revealed yourself as faithful in our marriage. 36 years and 31 years um, of ministry into our 31st year of ministry here. I think it's 31. So, Lord, we, we give you the glory. We give you the credit. We give you the praise. You have enabled us to stand, and we give you the praise and thanks, Lord. Thank you for these dear people who pray for us and who love us in spite of ourselves, Lord, and who go on loving us. So we love each other in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. If anyone wants prayer,